Meta Modern Era by Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi. Read by Sukhanil. Chapter 9 Evolution. It is very interesting to see how we have become human beings in a relatively short time through our evolutionary process. The time taken to create human beings is really very short. Some people may call it a chance, but by the law of chance, we could not have achieved this creation. Actually, our evolutionary process is based on the same principle as that of a spacecraft. The spacecraft has several sections, one fitting into the next in a series. When a spacecraft is launched from the ground, after some time the lowest or outermost section blasts the rest of the spacecraft, which then acquires a much faster speed. If the initial speed was, say, x miles per hour, then after the first blast it becomes 2x miles per hour. Through a series of such accelerating blasts, the spacecraft travels outside the gravity of the Earth and proceeds towards its target, which may be the Moon or Jupiter. That is how our evolution also takes place, with as great a speed. Life is first created at the stage of amoeba. After an explosion, life reaches another stage, that of an ape or other intermediary stages. After a series of such explosions, human beings are created. At the human state, in the beginning, our attention is only on food and some protection from nature, like a house or a hut. After achieving that, once a certain stage of higher development is reached, we suddenly get exploded into a state where we become mentally very alert and intelligent. Thus we take to science and develop technology by which we could go to the moon or Jupiter. Then with some other blasting different from mental achievement, we develop an emotional state in our being. When we see the whole world burning with hatred and competition, a new state is achieved, and this is a state of hankering for great compassion and love and peace. At this stage, or even much before, we start seeking something beyond human understanding. We then turn ourselves to another internal blasting, whereafter we take to religion and God. This is also not the final stage in evolution, because soon people find that religious practices are mere rituals which do not touch much less transform the inner self. It becomes apparent that we have to seek something beyond our minds. When the seekers of truth start seeking, seeking honestly, deliberately, but blindly at this stage, they are misled very badly into the clasp of false gurus, who actually are like thieves taking the dress of a king. It is described in our scriptures that man has to rise to a realm where he achieves the fourth dimension in his awareness, Turiya. Scientists like Francis Crick are working on the subject of awareness, especially the awareness of vision. The Turiya stage is the state of total subtle awareness. Scientists should reach the Turiya state and then discover the higher awareness which guides and promotes all worldly human awareness. Sometimes I find that scientists are lost in their blind alley and do not want to accept divinity which gives them a complete vision of reality. We live in three dimensions normally. The saints achieve their fourth dimension and through this ascent they reach a state of complete tranquility, complete integration and total awareness of reality. These efforts of their ascent have been described in different languages in different ways. The three dimensions in which we normally exist are physical, mental and emotional, and the fourth dimension is spiritual. Now, by intensely using the first three dimensions, we come to realize the futility of our lives, and we then start seeking the absolute truth, as we are not satisfied with whatever we know that can give even a tranquil mind. We had a saint called Markandeya, who they say lived 14,000 years ago. He has written about this fourth dimension and has described it as the blessing of the primordial mother. The second person who was very well equipped with this knowledge was Adi Shankaracharya, who wrote many books. The first book he wrote was Vivek Chudamani, 
in which he described this fourth dimension and explained why we should try to attain this fourth dimension. An intellectual, one Mr. Sharma, challenged him and told him that he could not do anything as an ascetic to win over the intellect. Thus he felt that for the common people, all this discussion might just seem to be mental acrobatics. So Adi Shankaracharya decided to write books just praising the primordial mother, especially Sondarya Lahari, where he described all the divine vibrations as the vibrations of the loving beauty of the primordial mother. At that time, all this was written in the Sanskrit language, but the common people did not understand this language, except for a very few learned people, who also did not want to go into the details of this exposition. Then came in Maharashtra in the 12th century a great saint called Nyaneshvara. It was a tradition of his time that one master of Nath Pantis could give realization only to one disciple. This master was not even supposed to talk about the fourth dimension to normal people. They were only told that they should remember God and should sing the praise of God. But he, the great poet and a very great saint, Yaneshwara, felt that it was time that the subject of spiritual ascent should be made much more clear to people. In the Gita, there is no description of the Kundalini or of the awakening, though Sri Krishna at the very outset has said that a person should achieve the state of sthita which means the one who is balanced through enlightenment by divine knowledge. All this was a description, but he did not talk about how it is brought about. It was Sri Nyaneshwara who wrote a treatise on the Gita called Nyaneshwari. In the sixth chapter, he very sweetly described the nature of this fourth power, called the Kundalini, which rests in the triangular bone, and the way it is awakened by some great soul, by which one gets his fourth state of awareness. He did not take permission from his guru to give realization to others, but he only asked that he should be permitted at least to write about it. Later on, this sixth chapter was not understood by the people who are in charge of religion, Dharma Martandas. They said that this sixth chapter was not to be read, Nishiddha, and thus this great chapter was completely neglected by the people, and they just try to follow the path of bhakti, which means devotion to God, by chanting the names of God or singing the praise of God Almighty. There were three types of movements in our country. In the first one, people wanted to know about matter, the origin of matter, and the origin of this world. In this quest, they came to know how our right side is built up, and what are the elements that build our body. The advancement in this knowledge led to science as a new field of study. Another aspect was constituted by people who were absolutely dedicated and were singing the praise of all the deities who were created by Mother Earth, Swayambu. They sang praise of God and prayed to God Almighty in the way their gurus told them. There were also people in the middle path who were called the Nath Pantis, especially in Maharashtra. These were realized souls who had achieved their realization through the one guru, one disciple principle. Saint Yaneshwara was also from the Nath Sampradaya, the Nath cult. He was a great exponent of Kundalini awakening. Later on, in the 16th century, many saints existed who started talking and singing about Kundalini, the channels and the subtle centers. All over India, all these saints talked about self-knowledge, self-realization, Atmasakshatkar. Some of the saints tried to give self-realization to their disciples, but they actually gave it only to very few persons, because they thought that the world was not yet ready to receive self-realization. As Kabir has written, How am I to explain to these people who are blind about the light? Most of the saints were tortured by people who were intellectuals and who thought that the saints were all bogus people trying to mislead the public. They are all, I think, coming back on the stage in these modern times, and without finding out the absolute truth, are just creating a platform against true seekers and also against real holy saints. But at the same time, there have been so many false masters and many women teachers as well, that it was hard to make out who was real and who was not. Firstly, 
The test is that anybody who takes money from you for giving you self-realization or knowledge about God or any kind of higher awareness is a man who is a thief of the worst type, who is trying to exploit people and who is a very low-level money-oriented person. But even before all these appeared, a lot of money used to be given as donations to the keepers of churches, temples, mosques, and also gurudwaras. So people did not know how to discriminate, and they thought that for God one has to give money. God does not understand money. He does not know any banking, and he has not created money. It is a human headache. The awakening of Kundalini was done by people who were very few in number, because there were very few real seekers. When I was born, I saw people taking to a new course all over the world, not to believe in God or spirituality, but to believe in money or power. At this juncture, I must say my father, who was another great evolved soul, came to my help and he told me, You know what is your mission in this life? I said, I know that. Then he said, you are standing on the seventh floor of a building. From there you see many who are on the ground floor. How will they believe that you are on the seventh floor? If you could raise them even up to the first or second floor, then they may start thinking that there is a higher state which they have to achieve. So the first slab of physical achievement is over, the second slab of the emotional is over, and the third, the mental, also will be over. But now they have to go beyond this mental, and that too, not individually, but collectively. I knew my mission of collective awakening very well, but I was born into such a blind world. My father continued, Any discovery which is individual has to be brought to the collective, otherwise it has no meaning. It does not serve any purpose. I told him, I know my job is to find out a method by which we can really give en masse realization. He was overjoyed to hear that, and so I started working on many human beings. My life with my father was full, with a lot of social contacts, because he was a great freedom fighter, and later on he became a member of our constituent assembly, the Central Assembly. I met lots of his friends, their wives, children, and I could see through my own subtle ways what problem was responsible for their static state. I started working and finding out, researching the source of the problems of human beings. At the end of 1946, I reached the conclusion that I had to do it in a very deep, silent way and through the inner movement of my being, I had to find out what was so problematic about human energy centers and their three channels. Ultimately, in the year 1970, I had to go to a seminar of one of the so-called masters because he invited my husband, who had his friend staying in that place and who arranged my visit. I was amazed to see this man, who was ten years younger than me, looking at least twenty years older. But he mesmerized all the people, and they shouted and screamed, and some barked like dogs. Just by mesmerizing, he was taking them to their past. This really shocked me. I was sitting under a tree to watch what he was doing. At night I went alone to the seashore, sat there alone meditating about how, somehow or other, I could use my own kundalini for the en masse realization of people. That was the moment when it worked, and it clicked. I was surprised that with a little deeper penetration, I could work it out. The experience was like this. I saw my kundalini rising very fast like a telescope opening out, and it was a beautiful color that you see when an iron is heated up, a red rose color, but extremely cooling and soothing. The kundalini went through my fontanelle bone area, Brahmarandra, which was open from my childhood and was pouring out divine vibrations, Purna Brahma. 
but this new experience gave me a new dimension of understanding of my divine force. It came like a very promising reality that it was time for me to start my collective work. I found that the whole of my being was filled with great peace and joy. I opened my eyes, went to this false master and told him, Now the last centre can be opened for everyone. I was amazed to see that he had no idea about the centres or about the three channels, which I knew from my very childhood. I found out that there were so many of them who were very false masters, who were just money-oriented, working through mesmerism, by encouraging antichrist activities of immorality, or by saying that this world is coming to an end. I started my work with one person, and I was amazed how she reached her fourth dimension in no time. She was a very old but a very nice religious lady who achieved this state in no time. Another one was a younger lady, who also was very easy, and in seconds she received her ascent. Since that day she has got her vibrations. Then I took some twenty-five people to the same seashore, and I was surprised that twelve of them felt the self-realization. From that day, this work started working en masse. Of course, now even if there are eighteen to twenty thousand people, almost all can get their self-realization, especially in Russia. So many people have been cured in these conferences. I must confess that I am lucky. I am being used as the desire of God Almighty to emit these forceful holy vibrations to give realization to thousands and thousands of people very happily. In my life, to my amazement, the time has come, the blossom time, where there are so many flowers on this earth who are seekers of truth, and they can easily become the fruits. I had to move to London because my husband was elected to the post of Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, and there I started my work with seven hippies who were very difficult people. I found that in their escape from the Western culture to anti-culture, they had become extremely arrogant, possessive, and aggressive. I started to work on them, and gradually they became aware that they were not in the fourth dimension in which they always felt they were, and that they had no right to assert their so-called higher state existence on others. After four years, I could manage to get these seven hippies to come around. In between, I kept coming to India and had a great response in my state of Maharashtra, where thousands of people started getting realization.